So whether you enjoy trips or not, it's fun, it's challenging, and you have company. All of that deserts you when you get to the summit. And as my old boss used to say, you're now flat on your face in the snow, exhausted. It's not fun. You have to invent the challenges and you get pretty short of company. Just what are the statistics of success? As a suggestion, go back to Fortune 500 article that they wrote in 1999, which has spawned a multitude of reports on chief executive success. Ray Williams wrote subsequently in June this year that in the last two decades, 30% of Fortune's 500s CEOs lasted less than three years. Now you'd think, wouldn't you, that to get into that group, you'd be pretty accomplished. Williams says that top executive failure rates are as high as 70% and really less than 30%. CEO tenure is down from 10 years in 1995 to an average of about seven and a half years today. The Harvard Business Review reports that two out of five new CEOs fail in their first 18 months. Strategy firm Booz Allen claims to have completed one of the most comprehensive studies of CEOs over a period of six years. And they saw CEO turnover of major corporations increase by 53%. The number of CEOs departing after poor financial performance increased by 130% and an over 20% decline in tenure. Oh, and by the way, the MBA won't save you. Research suggests you might be better off without that. Pity no one told me about it. So top leadership roles are tough and they're getting tougher. Now let's throw in a major crisis like COVID-19. Imagine yourself appointed last December to a significant chief executive role in an airline, a travel business, or in hospitality. Boy, it all looked so good. The skill set the board was chasing in you covered growth and profit. Six months later, it's also very different. It's about survival. But let's not get too gloomy and let's just remember the observation that John F. Kennedy made in considering the word crisis. He said the word in Chinese was made up of two characters, one representing danger, the other opportunity. And this crisis will fundamentally change the way we do business going forward. We may even be looking at another industrial revolution. And in that change, there'll be winners and losers. The leader's role is to position his or her business on the right side of those two options. When we're brought in as an executive search firm and contracted by a board to find a new CEO or a critical member of a top management team, we will inevitably be given the job description and the person's specification. I'm sure you've all seen them, that perfect description of Ken and Barbie that really mirrors the final appointee. But what's missing? After all, the board's given a great deal of thought to those documents. What is missing is the required outputs. What do you want the person to do, to achieve? We know that once we have that, we can judge the candidate's abilities and their qualifications to deliver. Many organizations, and this is particularly true of government, national and local, are overly focused on process. So much so that they often look the quest, overlook the question, can he or she deliver? After all this preamble, it brings us to the key issue in the selection of leaders. Can the person execute? Turning back to Williams, he suggests that failure boils down to arrogance, ego, and a leadership style out of touch with modern times. Yet those elements, yes, those elements cause issues, but the two most important qualities expected of a leader are firstly, the ability to execute well. You have to actually get the right things done. And secondly, you have to move quickly to sort out people issues. Fortune magazine showed that many CEOs failed because they tried too long to prop up people who were just not suited or up to the task they were given. If you look at many of the top leaders in history, they fall far short of all the glowing qualities those book and article writers suggest are necessary. But they had one common quality. They got things done. Many years ago, when I was asked to lecture on leadership for the first time, I fell back on a book I liked very much as a student. See if you can get a copy. It's called The Social Psychology of Industry by J.A.C. Brown. It's in an old Penguin edition. You can probably get a used paperback version through Amazon, but perhaps be a little more careful than I was. I must have pressed the order button too often because I received three copies. Never mind, they were only $1.69 each, 
And it's a small price to pay for one of the most useful pieces I've read on leadership. Brown set out to study all the personal qualities of great leaders, you know, the usual stuff, intelligence, sense of humour, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He was then planning to rank those qualities in order of priority. What puzzled him in this process was the lack of common dominant factors. So Brown turned the research upside down and he asked instead what one common factor could be found in each individual who was a successful leader. He came to the conclusion that the single most important feature that successful leaders have is what he termed insanity in the appropriate direction. It's the passion for the goal, the unrelenting pursuit of an objective, the refusal to allow obstacles to deflect purpose that marks out our standout leaders. That passion drives them forward and articulated well brings others across broken glass with them. It's the very essence of leadership. So the first and most important of the few things I go looking for as a search consultant in selecting a leader is passion. The ability to make things happen, to do things, to get results. That feature always dominates my thinking. So if that's number one on my list, what are the other things I want to tick off? Well, secondly, if you're to lead successfully today, you need to possess one essential functional skill, be that financial, marketing, sales, operations, and you should have a grip on the others. Thirdly, you need to understand bottom line and how to run the business or organization financially. And it doesn't matter if that's a not-for-profit. You need to understand the basics of cash in, cash out, the quick and liquidity ratios, and when you're going to run out of this stuff. What kept your CFO awake at night last month? The board will be relying on you and it's probably why boards inevitably have an accountant and 71% of CEOs come through the finance function. And finally, you need to have that ability to drag people with you over that broken glass if necessary as they buy in to your vision and goal. Well, wait a minute. How about you set the final objective and buy into their way of getting there? Now we're talking. Many years ago, when I was working in process improvement, I had some success in reviewing and writing about turnarounds in various sections of the publicly listed company I was working with, although other people had handled the implementation of my recommendations. I just finished one major report in a subsidiary company that was losing substantial money, and I was sitting back thinking of my next golf match when my boss, the group CEO, walked in from the board meeting, tossed the report on my desk and told me, well, the board liked that report, go out there and do it. No one had ever asked me to convert the academic thinking into practice. On day one, after exiting the GM, the tea lady and the odd job man, I was forced into the cafeteria for lunch. After all, there was no tea lady to bring my lunch. As I sat down with the manufacturing manager, he commented that I appeared to have been busy on my first morning. He then told me he'd read my report and agreed with the end objectives that I'd set, but not my method of getting there. If you do that, he said, you'll kill the business. So I asked for his thoughts. Well, he said, you can go upstairs, read the five reports I've written that have been ignored by your predecessor, and then talk with me. Or you can give me a check for $11,000 and I'll undertake to fix the manufacturing problems by Friday. The second option was too good to ignore, so I put myself in his hands. Two other managers at the table then became very excited and asked me to follow them into the distribution area. They said, give us a check for $1,900 and we'll take out nine people. And they did. The process became contagious and I learned my real first lesson in leadership. Get the people involved, let them own the way forward and let them take the credit for delivery. We turned the company back into profit inside three months. I was on a global strategic Zoom call recently with international colleagues and someone mentioned I should watch the TED talk by the Italian participant, Ernesto Ceroli. It was one he evidently gave in Christchurch a few years ago. I watched it and it was fascinating. Ernesto spoke of a number of major projects he had been involved in with the Italian government as they sought to bring major change in Africa. In all, some 18 extensive and expensive projects which the Italian brief would greatly aid the people, all fell over when the Italian consultants stepped back. 
As Ernesto commented, what we learned from that was to shut up and listen to the people. And that leads into the next part of successful leadership, a process called style. It comes back to the Williams comments, which in my view are more about style than cause. Good execution, however painful and rough, will produce results in the short term and the leader will be praised even if he or she is disliked by the team. But the long-term iconic leaders execute and build people and loyalty around them. There's no place for arrogance or ego in a true leader. It's not about building a personal brand as a leader. It's about the team. An interesting test for graduates or young managers that you can always make is to ask them to write down the names of the managers they admire in their world or sphere. The results are incredibly predictable and almost inevitably missing the names of those who make the biggest impact. For example, in an exercise like this recently, one name cropped up several times. He was CEO of a significant business turning nearly $2 billion. A private company I work for in the same industry, turning about $600 million, made more profit in two weeks than that major competitor made all year. Yet the name of the CEO is virtually unknown. I'm officially the executive search supplier of the smaller company, but no one leaves. That same company has a corporate social responsibility program that sees a percentage of its profits going to the community. Which one should we applaud? In this issue of style, there's an old Taoist saying, I, th I think from about 600 BC, that goes, to lead the people walk beside them. As for the best leaders, the people do not notice their existence. The next best, the people honour and praise. The next, the people fear. And the next, the people hate. When the best leader's work is done, the people say, we did it ourselves. Coming to the present day, let's reflect on the thoughts of Nelson Mandela. In his book, Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela likened leadership to shepherding. The leader, he said, stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow not really realizing all along they're being directed from behind. His motto, lead from the back and let others believe they're in front. As those who studied Mandela pointed out, he was passionate, courageous, had endurance and was inspiring. One authority said in considering Mandela, we all too often see the markers of potential leadership as those who take the lead in a presentation, appearing to know more than you do when in fact these facts may be the opposite of what we need in a leader today. In 40 years, I've appointed many chief executive and functional leaders, both here and offshore, and the outstanding ones remain firmly fixed in your mind. For example, three years ago, I appointed a Kiwi who'd been working in the United States to a key CEO role in New Zealand. His name would mean nothing to you, and he goes about his business unnoticed. In spite of hitting the company, he does not feature on its website, and the talented executives who's appointed front the business. He has no ego, and he doesn't drive any personal brand. His team does it all and gets the credit, but they love him to bits. In talking about one of his direct reports recently, I commented on how much growth that executive had exhibited in the past two years. The CEO looked at me and said quietly, he had all the skills, and he could smell a deal from the door. I just had to stand behind him and show how to execute it effectively and profitably. So what I recommend to aspiring leaders when they get to sit in the chair, take note of the comments of Patrick Thien, who's also studied the failure of CEOs. He says, you don't need a fancy CEO to fix your execution problems. Just slow down, think and figure out what you really need to do. Build a simple execution plan, with very clear goals and the milestones to get there. Work at it every day, Watch what is working or not working, as well as who is working and not working, and be courageous enough to make the right adjustments. During COVID-19 crisis, I've had the time to talk and work with many who are looking to the future with anxiety, but also optimism. Business will still exist, but perhaps as I hinted earlier, it may be in a different format. There are two important points for leaders or aspiring leaders to think about in that. Firstly, as leaders, we need to recognize we do not have all the answers, but finding and executing them is our job. So remember that innovation invariably comes from the edge 
and not the centre. So look to your people for those solutions. Secondly, and finally, remember the quote from D. Hock, change is not about understanding new things or having new ideas. It's about seeing old things with new eyes from different perspectives. Change is not about reorganizing, re-engineering, reinventing, recapitalizing. It's about reconceiving. When you reconceive something, a thought, a situation, a corporation, a product, you create a whole new order. Do that and creativity will flood your mind. Do that and you'll release fundamentally new ways of working and being and you'll be well respected as a leader. So go well. Some fascinating real life leadership insights there from Dr. John Peebles. I particularly enjoyed some of the interesting um, similarities to some of the things that Chloe Swarbrick talked about um, in an earlier presentation. Fascinating stuff and happily, John, uh, uh, Dr. John Peebles is available for a live Q&A. So once again, if you could just click the sessions link on the left hand side of your screen and then his Q&A group to ask him questions, please don't be shy to jump in with video or of course, just write your questions in chat. And Suzanne, as always, will be over there in sessions to facilitate that Q&A. And of course, we will be back here on the main stage for our final speaker in what's just over 10 minutes at um, midday. This will be with IMNZ uh, facilitator Nick Predel, who will finish the summit, summit with something a little different when he gives a special teaser training event, which will be followed by another live Q&A. So we'll see you there for that one in just over 10 minutes at midday. <laughs>